I'm Mona. I'm Nishi Rose. And I'm Sophie Hanna, and I want to welcome you to episode 67 of Ethnically Speaking, the show where we discuss everything affecting the UK's highly melanated communities, from current affairs to pop culture and everything in between. Now, we always keep it 100, and we're going to do the same today as we talk about shady behaviour in the UK government. Now, firstly, it was revealed that Health Secretary Matt Hancock had failed to declare that he owned more than a 15% share in a company that was awarded a contract by NHS Wales that was worth £300,000. Then text messages between Boris Johnson and Sir James Dyson surfaced where the Prime Minister promised to fix issues faced by Dyson employees so that they would not have to pay extra tax in coming to the UK from their Singapore headquarters in order to make ventilators during the pandemic. That makes me want to know, is it acceptable to bend the rules for friends and family members who ask for favours? Is our current government corrupt? And where is the line between lobbying and cronyism? So to the first two parts of your question, I think that yes, it is acceptable. Ooh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know, one second, one second. I feel depending on the circumstances, it is acceptable to bend the rules for friends and family. But even saying that out loud, I feel like a fraud. I feel like a fraud to say that. But I mean, yes, hold on, let me be serious. Yes, I do think that is acceptable to bend the rules for friends and family, depending on the circumstances. And do I think the UK government is corrupt? A million percent. So in terms of bending the rules for friends and family, I think if it's a thing where it's like you work at a restaurant, your mates come in, they want some chicken and chips, you're going to throw them an extra wing in there. No one's going to know. Of course, when it's your friends and family, you're going to do them a favour. Um, I'll tell you some of the favours that I've done for my friends at my companies, but I don't want to get in trouble. Um, in terms of it having the same effect when you are in a different line of work, it's completely different. And I think that your friends wouldn't even ask you to do that because the risks are bigger. And also morally and ethically, giving someone a free chicken wing uh, or working in like a government and bending the rules, in my opinion, is completely different. And I think that the UK government is 100% corrupt. And when we look at Matt Hancock, I think not only the fact that he has shares is it something like his sister is the director that rubs me up the wrong way because it's like you know you're supposed to switch off from work and home and there's certain conversations that you're not allowed to have regardless of if you're talking to your friend or your family member it's just protocol you're not allowed to have those conversations are you seriously telling me that during someone's christening during family meal you're going to pass over you know some potatoes you're not just going to quickly slip a one two one two of course you are like that's brother and sister that's a direct relation i'm inclined to believe that they would have these types of conversations so if you are in this position i'm supposed to trust that you are a fair person you're not going to try to push things that could potentially benefit your sister and benefit yourself of course you would like I just think it's a no-brainer and I think it's completely shady and I'm not too clued up on um, lobbying but even that whole process people are supposed to hire a professional who could be an ex-prime minister for example but you're not supposed to do it yourself and there should be some sort of formality sending texts doing it over drinks you're mixing business and pleasure and uh, a realm like this that the two just do not go hand in hand for me I think it's a no-go zone and it's always trying to trick people so if we use the acronym ACOBA which is like the governing board of where this where like ex-prime ministers are supposed to register so before they go on to take new roles they will run it by ACOBA basically it says that they are required to do this however they're not obligated to do this What? How does that make any sense? I don't even understand that. How can you be required to do something, but you're not obligated to do it? That makes no sense. Someone explain it to me because I don't get it. So what I think it is, is that if there is a, I think if there's like some sort of conflict, they are required to go to a COBRA and declare it and to gain information, but they are not obliged to take the information and act upon it. Okay. 
Which is a much of a muchness because obviously people are going to take advantage. If you, all I have to do is listen to what you say, I'm like, I can listen to you all day. If you, if I don't need to take your advice, it is what it is. <laughs> you know, guys, I like, so I agree kind of. So I think that it's completely fine to do favors for your friends and family in the workplace. And I think often it's for a lot of people, it's the way they get into, you know, I don't really agree with the whole unpaid internship thing, but that's right. And that takes place and people, you know, that like that kind of nepotistic quality of people getting into certain industries by having work experience through a friend or getting a job through a friend or getting a discount on something through a friend. I think like ultimately your friendship is more important than the company that you're working for or whatever it might be. So although, again, I kind of feel like a fraud saying this out loud, <laughs> um, but I think we all do that, you know, like personal bonds should come first. And if you can help somebody out by doing something that won't harm anyone else, and I think that's like the crux of the issue, really, because with Matt Hancock, the problem is like he's in government, he's an elected official. He is like, the, and, and the same with the Boris Johnson messages. Like what it kind of seems like is out of this entire crisis, which has killed obviously tens of thousands of people, it's reduced lots of people to poverty. It has completely destroyed livelihoods and lives and the economy and so much more. And I think the reason this feels slightly or sits really uneasily is the fact that people are profiting from it and all these sort of shady deals the one the people that we that we elect or are supposed to represent only our interests and supposed to be trying to help us as a nation and us as a people and that's why they're in power are actually also helping others gain from this crisis and that's why it's so it doesn't fit right and that's the kind of conflict here in this particular yeah instance. Yeah, I, I agree with both both parts of what you guys have said. I think people, I think it's natural to bend the rules for friends and family. Like, I could tell you all day that I'm too busy to come and help you do something. But then if my sister needs something, I'd be like, okay, no problem. I'm, I'm packing up the car. We're going to, I'm going to come down. We're going to work this thing out. So I think there is a, a natural affinity that we have for the people who are in our lives and who we have, like, close relationships with. One thing that I would say, though, is because I was very much on the lines of when it starts to affect somebody else, when, for example, like the government, they're supposed to be thinking about the best um, the best interests of the entire public. And therefore, that means that your sister might have to come second to that. Like her winning that contract for 300k might need to come second because there might be someone who is better equipped to do that job who has more experience. But in terms of bending the rules for family, wouldn't we then say that somebody is always missing out? Someone is always going to be on the rough end of that stick whenever we do anything. Like if we give away the chicken wings, I mean, it's basically stealing. It's like it's, it's basically stealing from like our employer. And I'm not saying that it's not something that I wouldn't do or I might be like, if if I worked in a shop, I'd be like, yeah, come like 10 minutes early, I'll let you in to get the discounts, no problem. But the point is there is always that thing that it is unfair to other people when we bend the rules, like the rules are there for, for a reason. So I don't know if there's any way around that though, because again, if I had a friend who was looking for a job and I worked in a certain industry, I'd be like, I'll put your CV to the top, that's the most I can do. I can like make sure it gets seen and then what happens from there really is down to you. But I think as Nushi said, there is so much nepotism in certain industries. I mean, even if you can take an unpaid internship and still live and survive, that's because you're probably coming from a family who knows people and you don't need the resources in order to live while you're working there free for like a month. So yeah, I, I, I don't know. And I think, yeah, I think the government is corrupt, but more corrupt than any other government? Probably not. I think what really grinds my gears is that they are corrupt and it's the almost this arrogant, blatant, I'm going to do whatever I want to do and not really suffer the consequences. Do you know what I mean? Because I think if we were just going back to the whole situation of how they're liaising and they're making their deals and stuff, there is a professional way of doing things. And regardless of what your position is, a lot of the time, it's not about what you know, it's about who you know. And you can't be apologetic for who you know or where, like, you know, the people you're affiliated with. It just it is what it is. But if you were somebody who is, hopefully has a good moral compass, the way that you 
maneuver would hopefully show that you have a good code of conduct, right? And like I said, just having contract deals discussed over drinks, reassuring that people's companies and assets is going to be okay over text messages. It does seem sneaky. It's done in a sneaky way. And the fact that the government is backing this and saying that, no, no, everything's been done in a libel way and no codes have been broken. Really? Really? <laughs> because I'd be inclined to believe that if these people weren't so high up or weren't in the government full stop, they'd be the first ones to point their finger out and tell them that's not good practice. So don't try to pull the wool over my eyes. And it's just annoying that these people are going to continue to do so and get away with it. And of course it has been done before, but now it's being done in a way where it's so blatant in your face. It's almost as if they don't care. And it gives us the impression that they are above the law. Anything they say, it's one rule for us and one rule for them. And I just don't like that. I also think, kind of like Moni was saying, there is this thing where people in power know other people in power. And so is there also like an underlying question, which is, it's not really about these ventilators. It's more to do with, um, like, these kind of deals actually sustain kind of inequalities by sort of supporting each other and bending the rules for people who already don't, the rules are already bent enough for them. Because there was this question which was, um, if it was a charity coming and asking for ventilators to be made and asking for rules to be bent, and um, it wasn't sort of a billionaire who's one of the most, who's the one of the top ten richest men in the UK and has profited his entire life from, um, you know, his own inventions and selling things to all of us. If it was actually a charity, would we have the same objection um, to these text messages and to Boris Johnson willingly bending the rules by WhatsApp? To be honest, like, I don't actually have a problem with the whole Boris Johnson, Jamie the Dyson situation. I think from the messages that we saw, yeah, I don't actually have a problem with it. Because James Dyson went through the normal, the legal, the proper channels, first of all. He wrote the letter, I think, to Rishi Sunak, um, explaining and saying, because he was specifically asked, by the British government to come over and to make ventilators because his company had already been trying to make ventilators in general before the pandemic. So they said, can you come over? And he said, we're happy to come over and help. But then he asks for a tax break because he says in order for his um, staff to come over and help, if you're in the UK for longer than 90 days, then you have to abide by our tax rules, which are pretty high. So he said, can they get a tax break because they've been asked to come over, they're working for the pandemic. So can they not be taxed the extra amount that they would have been past the 90 days? Now they didn't respond to James Dyson. So then he sent the text message to Boris, like, did you see my letter? I want to know, can we get this tax break? Blah, blah, blah. He was like, don't worry, I'll fix it. Now, when they said they'll fix it, they also gave that tax break to everybody. They extended it to everyone. They're like, if you're coming to the UK to help specifically with the pandemic, then you will have the tax break to make sure you don't pay extra tax. And I think that's more than fair because these are people that wouldn't have been here anyway. They came over here to specifically help. So that one I don't have an issue with. My thing is Boris Johnson is just very sloppy. He does a lot of things that people tell Like people said, you, Boris, you can't be giving out your number willy-nilly. You're too easy to access. And he doesn't want to listen to this sort of stuff. And this is where he gets himself into these sorts of problems. So that one, I don't specifically have an issue with. With the Matt Hancock one, mm, not even Matt Hancock. It's something that you said, Mona, about people should be able to have morals and ethics in order to act in a certain way. And I agree with that. But I don't believe that anybody in government in power gets there because they are the most altruistic. I don't think they get there necessarily because they're the most qualified either. I don't think Boris Johnson is the most qualified person to run the country. A lot of people get into these powers of position in government because they're willing to grease hands. They're willing to, you know, cut a deal here, cut a deal there. They're willing to let this person come through. Like when Boris Johnson went forward to be the head of the Tory campaign and all the other people were on the panel, there was only one person, his name was Rory, and I forgot what his surname was. He was the only person cutting down Boris Johnson saying he's lying. This is not going to end then. He's not going to get us out of the EU at this time. It's not going to happen, blah, blah, blah. And everyone else stayed silent because they said if Boris Johnson got in, they didn't want to kind of say what he was saying was untrue because then it would affect them from getting a position within his cabinet. And this is what happened when Boris got in. All those other people got positions in the cabinet. So when you're dealing in a place where you have to kind of be mindful what you say and you have to make sure you're on side with the right people. By the time you get into these positions of power, I think there are a lot of people who you now owe who are looking 
for you to repay that debt that they gave to you in order for you to be in that position. So if your Tory campaign was sponsored by billionaires, they're going to expect tax breaks and they're going to expect certain things. It's like, we made sure that you got into that position. So I think that the good guys are finishing last in terms of being in power. They're not the people who are nominated. And what we see is people who have all these ties connected to them of people who have placed them there, who they now are accountable to at the detriment of the people who really need them, which is the, the British face in public. Shut me up, Sophie. You shut me up. Because <laughs> <laughs> now you've said that, I feel like this always happened. Now you've said that, I've kind of gone back on myself a little bit. I'm just like... Mm. Well, it's kind of like, do you remember when Theresa May became Prime Minister and then Boris Johnson became the Foreign Secretary and everybody was confused. They were like, how is this man Foreign Secretary? He's offensive to people from different ethnicities and races. Like, he's not qualified. But my thing is, he has some dirt on. There is something going on how that man got into that position and then frog leap, then left that, then frog leap suddenly to the head of the Tory um, party. It's just, it's just a big old mess that is going on and I think the corruption runs so deep it runs so deep I don't think it's going to be different with any any government I just really don't so I don't know what the way forward is for that but yeah Boris Boris is just not trustworthy in general <laughs> that's my opinion I get that so but don't you kind of feel like even though everything you've said is 100% accurate I can't disagree it almost perpetuates like just this acceptance of being like, okay, well, they're shady, they've been shady, they're going to be shady and just kind of like sit back and relax. And this is what I mean that concerns me. Ignorance is bliss, right? If you don't know, then you can kind of conceal yourself and be insulated because you don't know. We do know now. There are articles that are being published. There are conversations that are being had. And we do know. And it's even worse for it to be so blatant. And now because it's just like, oh, yeah, well, we know politicians are a bit shady. We're just kind of like, oh, OK, which one is going to be the story that everyone's just like, no, I've had enough. Something needs to get done. And it is hard because I, I don't have any ideas as to what we could put forward to change. But I'm just saying this whole type of acceptance mentality, that doesn't really sit right with me either. Because it's like, even though we do know that they... This is just the tip of the iceberg, by the way. This is like a whole conspiracy. We only see what is being brought to the forefront. We don't even know the half of what is being, what's going on behind closed doors. So if we have this acceptance about it, it's like... Are we also part of the problem then? Are we kind of just turning a blind eye because we just think, oh, okay, well, there's nothing I do about it because they're just shady? I think I think we have to keep on voting. I think one of the things we have to do is make sure we're turning up. I know a lot of people like, I don't think vote because I don't think it's going to do anything. We need to turn up to voting. We need to um, sign the petitions that go to the government so they can know that people care about these things we have to talk about these things on our social media we have to talk about it online we have to really get a I don't know a platform to the things that are going on because I think you're right Mona it's very easy to just become really disaffected and just been like whatever because it's going to be corrupt anyway but I think it's difficult when we know like you said we only know the tip of the iceberg and the Labour Party has been fighting with um Tories to say you need to be more accountable in terms of lobbying and you know all of that was going on and they're kind of like oh we'll consider it we'll do a review but we saw what the race review is that they did that came out like a month ago which was just like England is a country that everyone should be looking at if you're white majority for how we've dealt with racism they make sure that they're only releasing the information that they want to release and I think that that report I was talking about it with somebody and they were saying what's scary about that report is it makes us now aware of other reports that come out from the government and probably are just as inaccurate and have just as much skewed the statistics because as people of colour, we're just like that race report was a joke to say there's no institutional racism. We need to tell a different story about uh, about slavery. One, you know, where it's just it's just the madness. So. I don't know how we keep them accountable apart from keep protesting, keep this, keep that. But I guess the question that I would ask back to you, ladies, is do you actually think it makes a difference to people who are Tory voters, though? Do you think that they're going to see what Boris is doing and be like, that's completely unacceptable. I'm going to vote for someone else. Or are they going to be like, no, nah, as long as I get to keep the greater proportion of my money, it is what it is. 
I mean, 100%. As long as they're not really affected, money is what lines their pockets and is what they're all about at the end of the day. As long as they get their cut, then yeah, I don't think that they do. I don't think that they're going to oppose to anything that he says. And I think that it makes it incredibly difficult to say what legislations or practices are we going to put in place to make them more accountable when it comes to, for example, reporting to ACOBA and taking the necessary advice and not actually being a a quiet not actually being required to, but being obligated to, as you would expect them to be, or when it comes to lobbying, having down certain practices that stop unethical decision-making happening. No, I don't think that they're going to be the ones to support that. And uh, it disheartens me to even say that because it does get me really upset and it does kind of give you like a pessimistic view and think, well, how the hell are we going to get out of this situation? Because it is something that we do need to get out of. So to answer your question, no. I don't think that they care and I don't think we're going to get the support of change from them. Yeah, I, I completely agree because I think currently politics both in the UK and the USA is now at a point where we're so polarised but we're not polarised based on real like issue-led, issue polarisation so it's no longer about key whether it, key issues so whether it's healthcare or climate change or whatever it's much more about how we view the other side and so an example would be... Um, when just before the Trump election, there was like a massive poll, this was in the US, where they um, looked at how people like would respond to um, Trump getting in or Trump not getting in. And something like 80% of Democrats believed that it would be okay to have some kind of revolution and people to be violent on the streets if Trump got in and the reverse for the Republicans if he didn't get in. Um, the fact that now we view politics, it's much more to do with identity politics in the sense that we demonize the other side without actually engaging either with our own beliefs and why we hold them, why we're affiliated with the party and uh, why somebody else is as well. And we stop seeing other people who don't agree with us as humans and or people just who have opposing views and just as the enemy. Um, and so because of that, I can't imagine that people in the Conservative Party or Tory voters would then think, would decide to switch sides. I can't imagine they would ever vote for other parties when they now, it's almost like intrinsic to contemporary politics where you where you just, you know, the other side is not a side, it's just, it is a nemesis and one that needs to be defeated and it's stopped being about the things that matter. I think that's so true. Sorry, go on. Oh no, I was just saying, I think that's so true. Oh, I was just going to do a a little detour. Going off what you said, Nishi, about if it was a charity who did the same thing, Mm. how would I feel about that depending on their mechanisms? And Sorry, it took me a bit of a while to process because I really wanted to like get my juices flowing and think actually how do I feel about that? This might be me being a little bit biased, but I think that I wouldn't have a problem with it because it kind of spins the narrative on its head. If it was a charity that was to send some texts in order to get a deal or whatever, I wouldn't have a problem because at the end of the day, they would be arguably the little man. And these people who take up so much space, um, it's they're benefiting from a system that they created in order to line their pockets. If we're looking at the amount of money that these people make, they don't actually need these deals. They'd like it, they'd want it, but they don't need it. If a charity was to do that, of course they would need the funds. And again, like this is arguably because we know that some charities can also have corruption, but I'm just taking away that side of it. I wouldn't have a problem because it would be the little man going up fighting for a cause and fighting for something that they felt they needed to do. And if they didn't speak up for themselves, Where else would they get the support from? So, yeah, I wouldn't have a problem with that because I think that they're being lucrative and trying to do the best that they can for a good cause. Whereas I don't feel that these politicians are doing the same. So, no, I don't think I don't think that they deserve that kindness from me to to be like, oh, okay, well, if it's okay for one to do it, then it's okay for another one to do it. No, I don't think so. Yeah. And I think that brings me on to the kind of lobbying versus cronyism. I don't think there is a line between them because I think that they're different things. Like lobbying is people who are trying to, you know, talk about why they disagree with certain legislation and really trying to win over whoever's in power to try and convince them about their position. Whereas cronyism is people allowing friends and associates to get into positions of power that they're not qualified for. But I do see that they feed into each other. And I don't think lobbying is a bad thing in in principle because anyone can lobby. You or I could lobby and go to our local MP and try to tell them, actually, this 
reworking that you're doing of the boundary means that my child is now going to miss out on a very good school that they would have gotten to last year. I don't think that this legislation is right. I think it needs to be changed. These are the reasons why. Because MPs should be in touch with people on the ground and knowing what's important to them. The issue that we have when we see the government and the lobbyists there is that they're hiring professional lobbyists, which is fine, but it's people who know how to get what they want, who already have relationships with the right people to bring about changes that will benefit a few people. And I have an issue with that because the little man, the little charity isn't getting heard. It's people who already have a position of power. So I think that the, the system is skewed. And again, like I said, Labour trying to ask for more um, accountability around it. But I don't think the Tories are going to want to do it because the system is benefiting certain people. And in terms of cronyism, no, I don't think people who are unqualified for a role should get it. And I think that's what we are constantly seeing with this government and especially the contracts that went out for the pandemic and PPE equipment. People were literally saying there were no tenders done. They only approached one company and gave it to them. Or with the children and Marcus Rashford and the children who were they were asking to have free school meals. When you saw what some of those school meals were, you were like, 100% that was someone's friend in the government because nobody saw that and was just like, that's the package we need to send out. Somebody's friend is benefiting from that. So there needs to be greater accountability. But again, like, who's, who's going to force them to do it? Things fall out of the public consciousness so quickly. We don't, and I guess that's the way the world is now. You know, you can have a story that's a really big story on a Sunday. By Wednesday, something else has happened and the other story doesn't matter anymore. So it's difficult, it seems, to kind of keep your foot on the pedal and really get people worked up enough to be able to have that long-standing mindset of protest um, that they need in order to say, because if people protest enough, like you see with the Black Lives Matter protest that happened, when I was looking online at jobs and whatever, the amount of equality, diversity and inclusion jobs online because the Black Lives Matter protests were, talk, were very much key about people saying there is a lack of diversity, there's structural racism. Every company jumped on, oh, we're going to look for someone who's going to make it more diverse, we're going to hire more people because they saw that there was a public outcry and that's the sort of things that we need to be doing to let people know we're serious about this because they kind of wait and see, they're kind of like, let's, let, let's see how much they protest. And if they don't, it's like, cool, let's just move on. And that's why I was saying that this acceptance mentality is so dangerous because if you feel like the power is not in your hands when it is, these are the things that happen. And you're absolutely right, Sophie. We are moving on to hot topic of the week every single week. People can't even catch a break. And I feel like that's why the shadiness of the government is on the increase or the incline because they know that people are, are just kind of have this can't be asked attitude. So if they're not going to challenge it, they can be more blatant and keep it going because people can't be bothered to do anything about it. They'll speak about it really quickly, have a five, 10 minute rant, be really hot underneath the collar. And then that's it. They don't do anything about it. Well, I was just going to say like the other thing this reminds me of when we're talking about corruption in government is the Preeti Patel bullying scandal. When she was found to have bullied her staff, so ridiculously, you know, people had to leave the government when they'd worked there for years and years, decades. And there was like a huge public outcry about it and all across the newspapers, all across the media. Um, and, you know, Boris Johnson was called to sack her and so on. And nothing happened. Um, so I guess it's also that cultural thing where actually we can protest, we can petition. But yeah, coming back to what both of you are saying, there are so many, there's so much corruption now. It's so rife that it's really difficult to have one kind of key focus or key kind of agenda because every single week there's a new thing. And I guess that's another difficulty uh, in the context of the pandemic, which I feel is so is used so often to obscure these things that are taking place and just use as an excuse, even when, like with Preeti Patel, it's completely irrelevant um, to what's, what the conversation is. Um, and I think that's also what makes it difficult at the moment because of this period of uncertainty and so on. Um, that is just used as a way to kind of back out of having conversations or act, taking actions that people otherwise would. Yeah, and I think with the whole Pretty Patel thing, again, do you, guys, I feel like Pretty Patel has stuff on Boris Johnson because you have to be willing to know that, you know, this person can't touch me or, like, if if it goes down, you got more to lose than I do. And that's why we see Dominic Cummings coming out. That man is out of the government. He's just like... <laughs> I'm going to make my peas anyway, Boris. So I'm going to come out 
and reveal your debt because you're prime minister. You've got way more to lose than I do. So people, that's the thing. You have to be so careful what you do on your way up. The people who you associate with, because yeah, people can, can tear you down. And I think it's just, it's like Game of Thrones out here, man. That's, that's what it feels like. <laughs> but <laughs> let me not move on to that because we've actually reached the end of the episode. Thank you for watching and listening to Ethnically Speaking, but help us to keep the conversation going. We want to know, do you think Boris Johnson and Matt Hancock acted inappropriately? Let us know your answers down below in the comments. And if you want a summary of everything we've talked about today, head on over to unitedmelaningroup.com forward slash ES067. The link will be in the description. And if you've been watching us on YouTube, you already know what we're going to ask you to do. Subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up so you don't miss a single thing. We're going to be seeing you again on Monday where we'll be talking about the dating experience of highly melanated women. But until that time, make sure you wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your distance and as always, stay safe.